Okay. My name is Mark Howard. I'm the director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative. I'm so excited for this event. I've been involved in a lot of events in my academic career, but I think nothing tops this. This has really been a long time in the making, not just the weeks and months of logistical planning and coordinating schedules and making arrangements, but actually, believe it or not, years, even decades in the making. Marty Tankless, who's gonna be one of our speakers, and I have known each other since we were three years old. Now, I could say we hatched the plan for this event at Lovey Dovey Preschool, where we first met, but it didn't quite happen then. It actually happened in a prison visiting room in the 2000s, when Marty was about a decade into his 50 to life sentence in upstate New York, maximum security prison. And we would talk in the visiting room about the things that we were gonna do when, not if, but when, he would ultimately be exonerated and get out. And so here we are today with a great group of speakers who are gonna tell us the truth about false confessions. And I just wanna say that I am in awe, and you should be in awe, of the four people who are sharing the stage with me tonight. Because Marty Tankless, Youssef Salam, David McCallum, Jeff Deskovic are four of the most courageous, strong, and inspiring people I've ever met. Between the four of them, they've served over 20, sorry, they have spent over 75 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit, 75 years. That's 900 months, that's almost 4,000 weeks, that's over 27,000 days that collectively they spent in prison. And while prison is a horrible place for anybody, and I go there on a regular basis when teaching as a volunteer professor, it's just unimaginable for people who were wrongfully convicted and have absolutely no business being there. Now, these four men that I'm gonna introduce, they share many features. They all come from New York, so this is a big New York fest here. Uh, Youssef from the Bronx, David from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is from Putnam County, and Marty's from Suffolk County on Long Island. Suffolk. Strong Island. Suffolk County. Suffolk County. Suffolk County. Suffolk County. They were also all juveniles when they were first interrogated, arrested, convicted, sentenced, and started serving time. Youssef was 15. David and Jeff were 16. Marty was 17. They're also all male, as you can obviously tell, and I say that because when I organize events and panels, I like for there to be gender diversity. But with this particular topic, it just so happens that 93% of prisoners in the US are male, and the vast majority, similar proportion of exonerees are also male. In all four of their cases, the conduct and work of both police and prosecutors was, shall we say, questionable <laughs> at best. <laughs> they also have some interesting connections between them that I learned about spending some time with them earlier today. The man who actually committed the crime that Jeff was convicted of spent time in prison with David. David knew him. The man who actually committed the crime that Youssef and the four others from the Central Park Five were convicted of lived in the cell next to Marty for several years. And that's an important point to remember when you're talking about wrongful yeah. convictions because what happened is that when the wrong person goes to jail, the guilty person actually stays free. And in both of those cases, those people committed other crimes, rape and murder, that these men were spending time in jail for. But most importantly, in terms of our theme tonight, they were all wrongfully convicted based on false confessions. Now, this is personally the case for Marty, David, and Jeff. In Youssef's case, it was actually based on false confessions from the other members of the Central Park Five that led to his conviction along with theirs. And I think that probably many people here, and certainly most people in society, think that false confessions don't happen. They think that it's a myth. They, there's this sense that right. innocent people don't confess. But the reality, and evidence has shown this, is that of the many hundreds of proven wrongful convictions, about 25% of them involve false confessions. And among juvenile wrongful convictions, it's about 40% of them that involve false confessions. So the truth is, false confessions happen all the time. 
And that's because the police are trained in a certain method of interrogation known as the Reed Technique that is extraordinarily effective at yielding a confession. The problem is it doesn't distinguish between true and false confessions. And so for a long time, there was a group of us in a community that was focusing on wrongful convictions, and I know that there's some members of the audience who are part of that team here. But we were on the margins. Mainstream society wasn't paying attention to us and to this issue. Most people prefer to watch Law and Order and other shows that have very simple plot lines where there are happy endings and justice is served and we can all go to sleep at night feeling relieved. But society's starting to catch up. And this is thanks in part to much better media coverage of injustice that takes place at every scale in American criminal justice and also several very popular narratives that have captured the public imagination over the past few years. I'm sure that many of you are among the 100 million people who listen to the podcast Serial. Is that right? Any Serial fans here? <laughs> I believe, actually, that Saad Chowdhury is here tonight, or had at least RSVP'd for the event, who was Adnan's closest childhood friend, who was actually the one whose sister led to the show Serial being created. I got to meet him a few weeks ago. And then, of course, in the last few months, hopefully many of you have watched Making a Murderer on Netflix. Any Making a Murderer fans here as well? So this has also brought a lot of public attention to an issue that many of us knew about for a long time, but that now has reached a much broader audience. And I think it's helped to wake people up to the injustice in our system, and especially the frequency of wrongful convictions. Now, What's interesting in terms of our theme is that Making a Murderer actually features what is almost certainly a false confession that's documented and that's shown. Also from a juvenile, Brendan Dassey, who was 16 years old at the time of his interrogation. And so what I want to do here is to just to give you a little window of the on the problem and also some, some commentary on it and some connections to two of the people here Namely, there's a little bit that talks about the Central Park Five and Yousef's case, and there's also uh, the, the comments of Richard Offshe, who was an expert witness in Marty's case, who helped to lead to Marty's exoneration. So I want to show you this little clip, which I think will set the stage well for our speakers. One teenager admits to taking part in a gruesome murder, landing him in jail for the rest of his life. Now his lawyers are saying that his confession was coerced. It's the linchpin in Brandon Dassey's controversial case. Tonight, my Nightline co-anchor Dan Harris investigates. Come on, Brandon, be honest. You can do it. Just tell us the truth. I grabbed her arm, put it on the side, and tied it up. Are we looking at a killer reluctantly unspooling the details of his crime? Let me put all the time and shot her. Why don't you draw where the blood stains would have been? Or are we looking at a confused, intellectually challenged teenager being manipulated into falsely confessing? The case of Brendan Dassey has leapt into the national consciousness as a result of the Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer. They got to my head. This controversial confession tape was the centerpiece of Dassey's trial. He's been in prison now for nearly 10 years, convicted of raping and murdering Teresa Halbach. But he and his family have maintained his innocence. They interrogated him and, and made him say what they wanted to hear. Dassey now has a new legal team, and they've filed a new federal appeal based in large measure on the argument that Dassey's confession was coerced. So we went out to explore these questions. If Dassey didn't commit the crime, why would he confess? And if this videotape really shows Dassey falsely confessing, what made the jury convict? First stop. We're going to Laura's office. Laura Nyrider, one of Dassey's lead attorneys and fiercest defenders. Come on, buddy. Let's get this out, okay? What you have here are police officers who are using psychological interrogation tactics that were designed for seasoned adult criminals on a 16-year-old with intellectual limitations. The interrogators aren't banging the table. They're not threatening him. Does it fit into the sort of classic model of coercive interrogation? Absolutely, it does. At the time of his arrest, Brendan Dassey was a high school sophomore in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. He had a low IQ and was enrolled in several special ed classes. He lived on the family salvage yard right next to his uncle Stephen. 
been released from prison after serving 18 years for a rape he didn't commit. I'm glad you're home, honey. <laughs> But then Avery was arrested and charged with the murder of Teresa Halbach. I just have a seat, Brendan. Several months later, Brendan was brought in for questioning. Caught air. Caught air where? On his throat. It appeared hard to be able to argue that it was coerced. Len Kaczynski was one of Dassey's original court-appointed attorneys. He says when he watched the confession tape, he became convinced there was no way a jury would believe Dassey was innocent. Kaczynski did try to get Dassey's confession thrown out. The defendant's motion to suppress these statements is denied. What are your thoughts after today? Well, we're disappointed in, uh, uh, we're start over. So Kaczynski steered Dassey to cut a plea deal. He even set up another interview with his client and the police. You and Steve had this planned? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. An interview Kaczynski actually skipped because he says he had Army Reserve duty. How on earth could you opt out of that? With 2020 hindsight, yeah, it was a mistake. For his failure to attend that meeting. Okay, I'll let you sign now. The judge removed Kaczynski from Dassey's case. Do you have a clear conscience? Yes, I do. Well, I did what I thought was uh, in Dassey's best interest. I don't think, though, those mistakes had any impact at all on the verdict in Dassey's case. Several months later, Dassey went to trial with different attorneys, and his confession dominated the proceedings. Your job at the end of this case will decide whether that statement ought to be believed. When you watch the videos carefully, they'll be exposed for what they are. And I think they're just garbage. Dassey himself took the stand. You made it up. Yeah. Sticking to his story, even under tough cross-examination. And you lied to the police. Yeah. Are you lying? You're lying today? No. The prosecutor at Dassey's trial made this confident assertion. People who are innocent don't confess. The defendant confessed because he was guilty, because he did it. But the fact is, innocent people do confess. Richard Offshee is one of the leading defense experts on interrogation tactics. He worked on the infamous case of the Central Park Five. I grabbed one arm. So I can grab one arm and congratulations, stuff. Five teenagers who confessed in gruesome detail to attacking and raping a 28-year-old woman in the spring of 1989. Every time she was told he was smacking, he said, shut up. He kept smacking. But these confessions were all false. They came to believe that they would only be able to minimize their punishment if they cooperated with the police. Turns out one out of four people wrongfully convicted and later exonerated by DNA evidence have made a false confession or incriminating statement. So when you look at Brendan Dassey's confession, what do you see? I see something that almost makes one ashamed to be an American. It's that bad. They get him to say anything that they want him to say. I don't feel if I was faced by cops accusing me of a crime I did not commit that I would confess to it. What would you do? I would say, get me a lawyer. And that's the difference. Those are the people I never see. The ones I see tend to think, I gotta get myself out of this. And probably your income is a bit higher than the average person. If she can get her client a new trial, Laura Nyrider hopes to demonstrate how she says the interrogators railroaded Dassey. We just need to hear the whole story from you. They reduce him over time to a place where he doesn't think that he can convince these officers of his innocence. And when he's at that position of hopelessness, then the officers offer him a way out. Your mom said you'd be honest with us. And she's behind you 100% no matter what happens here. That's what she said, because she thinks you know more too. Or in your corner. And what you see is Brendan begin to believe the officers and think, okay, I have to say these things that they want me to say. Even when Dassey breaks down and confesses, Nyrider says, by her analysis, he offers up no information that was not already widely reported in the media. The 25-year-old photographer disappeared last Halloween. His last seen taking pictures at the Avery Salvage Yard. Or directly fed to him by investigators. All right, I'm just going to come up and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Why didn't you tell us that? So I think of it. Any fair reading of that sequence is that Brendan is guessing in an attempt to placate his interrogators.
We reached out to the detectives in this video for comment, but our efforts were not successful. Even now that I understand that false confessions are a real problem in our justice system, when it comes to the case of Brendan Dassey, there are still so many open questions. If he didn't do it, is, is it just a total coincidence that he was at a bonfire that night with his uncle, and in that bonfire they found the remains uh, of a murder victim? Look, what happened that night is exactly what Brendan has said all along. The family had bonfires all the time to burn their garbage. Same thing with cleaning up the garage with his uncle. Again, this was an auto salvage yard. People were constantly tinkering around with cars and having to clean up after the fact. Even though two lower courts have already denied his appeal, Brendan Dassey sits in prison tonight holding out hope that a federal judge will answer his prayers. I wish I could have a family someday. Toward the end of Making a Murderer, he can be heard reading a letter with an emotional plea. I am innocent of the rape and murder of Teresa Halbach. Please help me if you can. Sincerely, Brendan Dassey. So do you think Brandon Dassey's confession was coerced? Head to the Nightline Facebook page to weigh in. So with that as background, I'm not going to take you through a full year. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But let's turn now to our featured speakers for tonight. And I'm going to introduce each one in turn just before they speak. And we're going to start with Marty Tankliff. Many of you know the story. Marty was 17. On the first day of his, which is to say our senior year of high school, his parents were brutally murdered. He was convicted of the crime. He served 17 and a half years. The entirety of the case against him was based on an unrecorded, essentially hypothetical false confession. One that Richard Offshe, whom you saw in that video, actually testified saying it's not only not evidence of his guilt, it's actually evidence of his innocence the confession itself, the text of the confession. After 17 and a half years, 6,336 days, 38 days, <laughs> they don't like to have you locked any off there <laughs> during those last two. Marty was exonerated December 2007. He was in college classes just a few weeks later. He earned his BA. He went on to earn his JD. He has many great things in store for him. He's going to be an outstanding lawyer. He's also an amazing speaker, he's an amazing person, and he's an amazing friend. So I'm thrilled to introduce to you Marty Tankliff. How are you? Um, just first of all, how many of you here have Mark students? You guys know about the homework assignment for tonight's speech? No? <laughs> okay, um, so I'm here because I'm passionate about false confessions. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken about the topic and most people still have a difficult time understanding how easy it is to make a false confession. So quite a while ago, I tried to simplify it to the most basic terms. How many people in here have a brother or a sister? Raise your hands. How many people, when you were kids, your parents went out, and while you're out, somebody broke a lamp or did something wrong in the house, your parents came home and said, listen, until we know who broke the lamp, we're not going out for ice cream. How many of the wrong siblings said, fine, I did it, let's go? You have just confessed to a crime. Now, if you want to amplify that a million times, imagine being isolated from family, friends, put into an interrogation room. And when you meet law enforcement, they never like to call it the interrogation room because they say, we don't interrogate people. It's an interview room. However, if you look at the structure of the interrogation room, it's usually windowless. There's no furniture in there or it's very limited furniture. There may be a desk with a big metal ring where they can tie, you know, handcuffs in there. It's isolated away from people, so if there's physical violence that takes place in that room, nobody can hear it or it's ignored. Each of those factors will weigh on individuals, especially when the interrogations will last hours. And most interrogations, what they do is they wear you down mentally, and they end up convincing you that the only way out of this room is tell us what we want to hear. You end up becoming doubtful 
of reality. You end up starting to question what you know is reality, is the truth or not. And it's all part of the techniques that are utilized by law enforcement. In my case, you know, for, for 17 years we've been telling everybody, or I've been saying what I said happened in the interrogation room, the detectives are saying what they said they had in the interrogation room. Unfortunately, there was no electronic recording. Yusuf and I testified probably seven years ago, I think it was right, about trying to convince New York State to implement legislation about the mandatory electronic recording of interviews and interrogations. Tragically, New York State still doesn't have the law in the books. Suffolk County actually had a policy and procedure in place. They chose not to record my interrogation. So for 17 and a half years, it's always been kind of a, I say one thing, the detectives say something else. Uh, through civil litigation, it got to a point where the lead detective who was involved in the interrogation was confronted and said, what if we brought you in a video of who actually committed the murders, would you still believe Marty's guilty? He said, absolutely. This is the mentality of, I don't want to say all law enforcement, but a great percentage of law enforcement that are involved in wrongful convictions. They build up this level of confidence that is beyond the reality of what the truth is. They feel that they're right, everyone else is wrong. They could be confronted with new witnesses. They could be confronted with DNA evidence. But if they got a confession, they're right, everyone else is wrong. These young men, except Yousef, okay, can demonstrate and can explain in more detail the impact of a false confession, okay? Yousef's conviction led to, you know, was precipitated by false confession of his co-defendants. But as human nature becomes, when people hear that someone confessed, you have a guttural instinct, well, if they confess, they must be guilty of something. Tragically, that's not the case. The Innocence Project is established by, I think it's like 27, 28% of all DNA exonerations, there was a false confession. Now, you start to question, could those detectives be so wrong? And you wonder how many of those detectives have come forward and said, we made a mistake. I can't remember a single one of them. But in each one of those cases, they were shown forensically that they were wrong. So one must start to question, how did they come about getting these false confessions? Um, it's problematic. But guess what? If they would implement the electronic recording of the interview, not simply the interrogation, because I've heard that before, everyone would be protected. So many in the law enforcement community, and I've spoke to them, I've lectured with them, said initially there's been this reluctance. Uh, one of the first things I heard was by Michael Palladino, who is the detectives, I think he's the detectives union representative, he said, well, we don't want suspects to know what's going on in the interrogation room. So I, at the panel, somebody said, well, if you're doing nothing wrong, you shouldn't be afraid of it. They said, but, you know, if they know how interrogations are conducted, they'll figure out a way to beat us. And, and, and kind of this was the mentality. Then I heard, and, you know, somebody said, it costs too much. I said, so it was 17 and a half years of my life, more valuable than purchasing record on, on, a, on a videotape, an audio tape. And each one of the men here can verify that it was that simple. If anyone looks at the Michael Crow case, Michael Crow's interrogation was actually videotaped. And in cases where there's a videotape of the interrogation, it protects everyone involved. It allows people to review the facts. It allows, it allows law enforcement, it allows judges, it allows juries. It protects each person involved in the process, so there's really no reason why it shouldn't be recorded. It didn't protect them in that case. It didn't protect, where's that figure? I just want to put that figure up for a second. Okay. What do you think these numbers mean? Twenty fifteen, one hundred forty nine. What do you think one hundred forty nine represents? Exactly. That number and the nineteen is nineteen so far this year. 
if you figure out 149 in one year, it's about one every three days, an innocent man or woman was released from prison. And if you think it's 149 people who were in prison for crimes that someone else committed, and in how many of those cases you really start to wonder, were those men or women in prison while the guilty parties were remaining free to commit additional crimes. The 19 is just for this year so far, but I just want to highlight that 19 also represents something else. In New York, in Brooklyn, Kings County uh, DA Thompson, since he's taken office, has exonerated 19 men just from Brooklyn. It should really scare people to understand this is not simply a kind of a local problem. It's an epidemic. It's an epidemic and people start to wonder, what can I do? Get involved. There's so much you can do. You can, you can go to your legislators, pass legislation. You can go to the next picture. Oh yeah. So there's actually somebody I want to thank tonight for being here. Sheila, can you stand up for a second? Yes, I'm embarrassing here. If it wasn't for Sheila, and some of the people in this picture, I wouldn't be here tonight. Because that is part of the team of lawyers that got me out of prison. And each one of the men up here can tell you that when an innocent person is in prison, it's virtually impossible to obtain an exoneration with one or two lawyers. Sheila was part of a team of probably 15 lawyers from three or four of the most biggest law firms from Washington, D.C. and New York. It takes an army. And Sheila could tell you that it was thousands of hours working on these cases. And, you know, quite often you see us up here, but I always have to acknowledge it was the people like Sheila, Dawn, Steve Braga, J. Sal Peter, Barry Pollack, uh, many of them are from D.C. area, who devoted years of their lives. When they got involved, they had no idea how many years it would take. I mean, Sheila, I think you were seven years you worked on the case? Long case, long case, seven years. You know, and that was after I had already been in prison for almost 10 years. And what's scary about this process is, is that quite often, lawyers develop the evidence of innocence. They bring the evidence to the prosecutor's office and the prosecutors do nothing with it. They don't want to investigate. They'll let you languish in prison for years. And in some cases, they've had the information for years before that, but everybody said, you know what? We're okay with this guy sitting in jail. Because guess what? We can live with ourselves. It really is an embarrassment to the system when you understand you have innocent people languishing in prison. You know? And I also thank Mark. I mean, Mark, Mark and I have joked over the years that, you know, what was it, jail to Yale, okay? We grew up together and we've taken different paths. But if there were more people like Mark, there would probably be more changes in the criminal justice system. Because I think making a murderer, serial, and doing events like this help educate the public and hopefully it resonates with other people. And we almost create a domino effect that you leave here you can go online, and you figure out how to help someone else. Because as the four of us are sitting here tonight, there's hundreds of innocent people sitting in prison, lost. They have no idea what to do. Uh, there aren't enough lawyers to work on these cases. Because everybody says, well, you know, how difficult could it be? You're innocent. You know, the evidence is there. I can't tell you how often and maybe Jeff or David or Yusuf can verify this, that where there's DNA evidence, the prosecutors still fight. And sometimes it's for years. It just doesn't make sense. So I want to thank you, and I think at the end we'll do some Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to turn to Yusuf Salam. Yusef was wrongfully convicted in probably the most notorious case in New York history. 
And it's one that actually has a lasting imprint on contemporary American politics, even this presidential race, because both of the leading presidential candidates from both parties have made statements that connect to Youssef in his case. Hillary Clinton, and this has come out recently, talked about this concept of super predators, which was this notion that came from the Central Park jogger case. And Donald Trump, at the time, took out a full page ad saying, bring back the death penalty to New York to execute these young boys who turned out to be all innocent. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the case of the Central Park Five, I have a two minute clip from the documentary, the award winning documentary by Ken Burns called the I Central want us Park. to remember what happened that day and be horrified by ourselves. New York in the late 1980s was a completely schizophrenic, divided city. New York's now the capital of racial violence. If I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. Criminality, gang wars, drug wars. Who was supposed to be afraid? It would have been irrational not to be afraid. Off with the camera, man! Last night, a woman jogger was found unconscious and partially clothed in Central Park. She was beaten and sexually assaulted. A woman jogging in Central Park. Central Park was holy. It was the crime of the century. Five youths were arrested at 96th Street, all between 14 and 15 years of age. They got him! You can only imagine the pressure to have this crime solved and solved quickly. First, we was all together. Then they started to put us in different rooms separately. What did you do? Who were you with? Who did you come with? The tone was very scary. I felt like they might take us to the back of the precinct and kill us. You're not going to go home until you give up the story. I told my son, go to the park that night. I feel guilty. I'm telling the guy, I don't know what you're talking about. They're getting a little angry. And they're like, you know, he did it, didn't you? He has been interrogated for over 24 hours. That amounts to pressure. These young men were guilty. It was almost unquestioned. The police controlled the story. They created the story. They seized on the fears of the people. Wilding, the bestial characterization of the black man. There's no DNA match whatsoever to any of these boys. I was going nuts. No blood on the kids. Nobody could identify them. But if they confessed, they confessed, and that was that. A lot of people didn't do their jobs. Reporters, police, prosecutors, defense lawyers. This was institutional protectionist. We falsely convicted them, and we walked away from our crime. This is the ultimate siren that says none of us is safe. Jogger was raped and left for dead April 19, 1990. Within the first few weeks, there was a tsunami of media reports. Over 400 picking apart our lives and painting a picture so that they can prepare the public for exactly what they were about to do to us. And this is the case in many times that happens. This letter that I'm going to read is important because this letter was dated six days after the Central Park jogger was assaulted. Our names, our phone numbers, our addresses were published in New York City's newspapers. And this letter states, no return address, it's only signed Captain Justice. It says, to Yusef Salam. This letter is to let you know that your name has been placed on the list of enemies of, of society 
by the Citizens Army New York City branch. You made a decision when you became one of the pack that decided Central Park was your arena and decided to attack and violate honest citizens who happened to be in the park. So just remember that even 20 to 30 years from now, some people will never forget. And maybe the one time that you don't check your back is the one time that someone just might be there to say hello. This is 30 years later, this time frame that we're living in right now. I was 15 years old. I just turned 42. Back in 1989, these reports, as was previously stated, led to a common citizen taking his money, really crumbs off the table for him. Maybe not even crumbs, it was the dust off of the table for him. Most people don't make $85,000 in a year. But this man took and paid $85,000 purchasing ad space in New York City's newspapers, calling for the reinstatement of the death penalty, specifically for our case. And what happened is that this led to other media personalities to chime in. And one in particular was a guy named Pat Buchanan. And in the paper he wrote, you know, let's take the oldest one, Corey Wise, and let's hang him from a tree in Central Park. Let's take the others and horse whip them. Maybe the city's park will be safe again. All of this was predicated upon false confessions that were found to be false 13 years after the fact. And when you look at the false confessions, when you look at how this whole thing happened, in our case, the Central Park Jogger case, the five individuals who became known as the Central Park Five were five individuals who largely didn't know anything about each other. We all met each other in prison. And so as you see in some of the video footage, one of the guys is saying, I grabbed her arm and somebody else grabbed her leg and somebody else did this and somebody else did that. When they picked up Raymond Santana and he of course was saying, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I was in the park. We were horsing around. This is what happened. And every time they said, was well, this where the woman was raped? He said, there was no woman. What are you talking about? And then finally, <coughs> he slides a photograph over to him and asks him if he recognizes this individual in the photograph. This person that he was showing him was Kevin Richardson. Kevin Richardson had a mark on his face. He said, do you recognize this, this man, this young, this young boy? And Corey said, I mean, Raymond said, no. He said, well, he's in another precinct right now telling us that you did it. We know he did it because he has a scratch on his face. That came from the jogger. But he's in another jail saying that you did it. Come on, Ray. We know you're a good guy. But you got to give us something. They didn't tell Raymond, and Kevin didn't even know that they were showing him this false information of this mark on his face, attributing to the Central Park jogger, until some years later. Kevin Richardson, when he was being chased by the cops, they said, stop or I'll shoot. And Kevin's adrenaline went through the roof, and he ran for his life. The cops, being much faster and bigger than him, ran after him, jumped on him, turned him around, and hit him in the face with their helmet and said, didn't I tell you not to run, you animal? That's where the mark came from. Now, I submit this because when you look at the fact that there was no DNA evidence in this case, and when I say there was no DNA evidence, I mean there was not even a drop of blood on any of our clothing. This woman lost 33, she lost three-fourths of her blood. You can't be a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old, 
and not leave DNA evidence. And I say that because I got a 20-year-old at home. And if he goes in the kitchen and he makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, <laughs> you better believe I know he was there because there's something left as evidence that he was there. <laughs> and so now, you mean to tell me this, this, this woman was brutally raped, left for dead, and there's no DNA evidence? And what's important is that in the case, in the trial, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Letterer said, she said, there will be no DNA evidence in this case. But what we do have is the false, is, well, she didn't say, she should have said we have the false confessions. <laughs> she would have gave up her whole, uh, you know, her script right there. But she said, what we do have are confessions. And so that brings us to the confessions. Raymond Santana. Well, first, let me just paint the picture. The Central Park Five film shows nothing new. For those of us who remember back in 1989, these confessions that looked like the city had done a slam dunk. For those of us who remember, and then we look at that and we put it right over the Central Park Five film. What we see is nothing new. The only difference is that now you have Raymond Santana, Corey Wise, Kevin Richardson, and Antron McCray talking about how these things came about. And I'm going to use Raymond Santana in this particular example. So he's in the film, and he's 14, by the way, at the time. But he's in the film, and he starts reading his false confession. 14-year-old boy. And I'm going to paraphrase here. He didn't say it quite like this, but you'll get the picture. At approximately 9 p.m., me and a group of my colleagues begin to walk south. <laughs> now, this is exactly what the public saw in 1989. And the best part about the film, this film that the city and the police officers said was poisoning the jury pool because Mayor Mike Bloomberg said that this was a no-pay case. In the film, Raymond looks up and says, what 14-year-old boy talks like this? And it was almost as if the people who had believed this for the first time saw with brand new eyes and heard with brand new ears something that they couldn't figure out how it made sense back then. How did we convict these guys? But see, what I submit is that through the use of media, through the use of the false confessions, and, and, and the worst part about these false confessions by far, the worst part is that in the Central Park Jogger case, the real perpetrator was out there committing more crime. Our supporters, our families, our loved ones continued to be out in droves, telling the public, you got the wrong folks. These aren't the individuals who did this crime. I mean, we have to all be honest at some point. We know what our children are capable of. I have 10. That didn't get no laughs. laughs. Is that a false confession? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the God's honest <laughs> truth. <laughs> but we know what our children are capable of. You know, if you say, uh, Johnny, uh, did you have that, did you, did you take the cookie that I told you not to eat? And Johnny got crumbs on the side of his mouth. You, no, I didn't, I, I didn't uh, eat it. <laughs> we know what our children are capable of. And, and here we were languishing in prison, trying to see if the system worked, hoping that it was the criminal justice system. But after we lost trial, after there was this legal lynching of sorts, we began to realize that it was the criminal system of injustice. We began to realize that these same officers who were on the side of cop cars in New York City, they have these three ideals. And these three ideals are these words, courtesy, professionalism, and respect. 
And I mean, I want officers to live up to those ideals, and I know that some of them are. But if you happen to be a black man in Staten Island, getting choked out, saying you can't breathe, they're not going to even give you the first letters of these three ideals. They won't even give you CPR. That's how serious this thing is. Matias Reyes, the East Side Rapist, for his final act, he goes and knocks on the door of a young pregnant Latina woman. She opens the door and he pulls out a knife. And she says, hold on, hold on. Let me put my babies in the next room. She then puts her children in the next room and locks the door. Matias Reyes then rapes her and stabs her to death. She was a young, pregnant Latina woman. Our supporters had been out there for months saying that you have the wrong people. The police officers were convinced that they had the right people and they didn't want to look for anyone else. The police officers didn't even catch Matias Reyes for this crime. The sad part about this story, the sad part about this story is that in the last cries of help, the neighbors in this young pregnant Latina woman's building came out of their homes and they jumped on him and they held him for the cops to come. He gets to prison, bumps into Corey Wise. They have a brief altercation. He knew who Corey Wise was, but that's not why they had an altercation. And then 13 years later, he bumps into Corey again. And he had forgotten about this crime that he said that he got away with scot-free. It didn't matter that he was in jail for 33 and a third years to life. He thought that this, this crime was the perfect crime because he got away. And now he sees Corey 13 years later, and he sees the pain and the hurt that this young man had been going through day in, day out for years. And he says at that point he had found God. And so he wanted to talk about this. He needed to tell somebody about this. And he goes to his comrades in prison and tells them there's a person in here doing time for a crime that he didn't commit, but I did. And they convinced him to go to the authorities in the prison. And the prison authorities convinced him to go to the DA's office. And this is how this case got solved. This is how the truth came out. This truth would have never come out had that miraculous encounter not happened between Raymond, I mean, between Corey and Matias Reyes 13 years later. And it's so, it's so, it feels so good to be able to be exonerated from that process. But 13 years later, that tsunami of media reports that happened in 1989 and in 1990 was nothing compared to the desert of media reports that happened when we were found to be innocent. This is one of the ads that ran. This is one of the jurors. He said, we got the wrong kids. We had been in jail for a crime that we didn't commit a crime that is only trumped by child molestation, a crime that the inmates have their own way of dealing with this kind of atrocity. It's a wonder that we survived. I'll wait till later to uh, talk about it some more. Thank you.
Thank you, Yusuf. Such a powerful story and speaker. Each one of these men could actually have the whole platform for a night. I'm going to turn to David McCallum. David's case is extraordinary in so many ways. David and his friend Willie Stuckey were coerced into false confessions. Again, the same trick that they used with the Central Park Five of telling them that the other had made statements implicating him and trying to minimize each his own role in the crimes. David went on to serve 29 years wrongfully convicted. He was exonerated in November of 2014. It's been a year and a half since he's been out after 29 years. During that time, his friend Willie died in 2001, an innocent man who never got to leave prison. David was himself repeatedly denied parole because he professed his innocence and thereby did not show remorse for the crime he was convicted of. But in part thanks to Reuben the Hurricane Carter, a very famous exoneree who worked really hard for David and many other people, he was able to get DNA testing that finally cleared him and that allows him to be with us here tonight. I'm also going to show, by his request, a two-minute uh, trailer for his documentary, documentary on him, David and Me. My name is David McCallum. I've been incarcerated since I was 16 years old for a crime I didn't commit. New York City in the mid-1980s, crime was at an all-time high. We wanted our city back. He was saying that they had found a, a body in the park, and I said, Officer, I don't know what you're talking about. And it was at that moment that he slapped me in my face. People do falsely confess to crimes, particularly young teenagers. These two teenagers had no chance with professional interrogators. Dear Ray, I was about your age when I came to prison. David's given him a sense of the value of his own life. I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth for David. And if it means trying to find the killers 28 years later, then that's what we're going to do. Did you know any of the kids that worked here? No. If I said some names, you wouldn't know anyone? Every single part of this whole thing is infuriating. You don't know where he lives? He's just... Even that information. Sorry. That's a dead end. There's always life and death struggles behind those walls. Any show of disrespect can mean your life. I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm bored in this place, you know? And I'm not gonna let nobody take that from me. Join me in welcoming David McCallum. Good evening, everybody. As you can see, um, I'm a wreck. This is what usually happens when I um, just walk is offered to come to these sort of events. I get really, really emotional because for so many different reasons, obviously, this is a very emotional topic for me. I just want to thank Marty for initially uh, bringing this to my attention, and of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Mark, and of course, if I didn't thank you guys for, for showing up tonight and inviting me as well. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've gave talks before about false confessions in general, and particularly in wrongful convictions, but I usually don't talk about my childhood friend Willie Stuckey. But I just want to take a little while, a little moment or two to sort of just talk about him. Um, Willie was arrested um, uh, uh, three hours before me, and during the course of his arrest, and of course when he was taken down to the police, uh, he was beaten by the officers, beaten by the, the arresting officers in the case when he made a confession, a false confession. And in that confession, he implicated me as a shooter of an individual by the name of Nathan Leonard. I was arrested three hours later, and 
I was brought down to the precinct, and as Marty said earlier about how they construct these rooms of interrogation where they're so small and some of them are windowless. Well, I was put into one of these rooms as well, and I was questioned, and I was asked one question. Um, did I know anything about um, someone getting killed in a park the week before? That would be October 20th. And when I said no, um, the officer slapped me in my face. And at that point, I knew, obviously, that something was seriously wrong here. So he said, if you don't tell me the truth, I'm going to hit you in the head with this chair. So he picked up that chair and raised it over his head, and he threatened to hit me with it. And so at that point, I felt like I had no other choice but to confess to a crime, even though I know that I didn't do it. So um, here, too, is especially like before um, – I was interrogated, they, what they do is they play this sort of good cop, bad cop routine. So one of the cops initially started asking me about where I live, um, how was my neighborhood. Of course, this is an officer that patrols the neighborhood probably every day, but he still asked me that question. And he also asked me did I, have, did I like sports and that sort of thing. So we were sort of engaging in that conversation. And so when the other officer comes in now, this is the mean, aggressive guy. This is the guy that comes in with a scowl on his face. He has a certain posture about him. Uh, sort of, sort of like an intimidating uh, presence about him. So that's always that's also a psychological design. It's designed to sort of intimidate you, you know. And so, you know, these are some of the ploys that they and tactics that they use against Willie and I. So there's no question about that. I wish every day, for the 29 years that I was incarcerated, that I wish they would have sort of beat my brains in, and, and maybe they wouldn't got the confession that they that they got. Because I have to tell you. Um, those 29 years in prison were absolutely miserable. I mean, really miserable. Now, I've been in prison with people that will tell you in a hot second that they did the crimes that they were committed of, you know, that they were convicted of. And they will be honest with you about that, right? But there's this 99.9% .9 of the guys that will tell you that they didn't do a crime, right? So I've heard that too. So but for me, um, I, was, I was in a lot of pain during a long time and the long stretch of my incarceration. But I like to tell everybody when I do these sort of talks that my life really changed in two or it started to change for the better in 2004 um, when I met a man by the name of Ken Crosby. And Ken Crosby was a former teacher in Toronto who had lived in Toronto pretty much uh, for the better part of his life after moving from New York City. And, um, you know, he had a young son named Ray Crosby who you saw in the film there, David and me, who co-directed the film. And, of course, the son was getting in some trouble and all that sort of thing. So his dad wanted me to sort of talk to him because his dad felt like I could relate to him in ways that maybe his dad couldn't. So I, I, I did that. And, and so at that point, I was introduced to Ruben Hurricane Carter, uh, Dr. Carter, who unfortunately passed away in April of 2014, uh, months before I was released. Um, but getting back to the confessions, um, people say, um, you know, why confess to a crime that you didn't commit? But I have to say, um, there are so many variables that goes into false confessions that I can stand here for hours and tell you exactly, you know, what they mean and why it happened. You know, for example, um, these individuals can tell you themselves that you know, they've been interrogated for days. Some of them, I mean, multiple days. And you know, for me, I was only interrogated for three hours, and I say only in comparison to some of the individuals who are con interrogated for for, for, the, for for long periods of time. And and uh, but the point I'm making is, it doesn't really matter. How long an interrogation takes? At the end of the day, the, the goal of a law enforcement is to secure, uh, secure a, a confession from an individual. By all means, they, they get it. And you know, and for me, I, I absolutely you know regret um, making those statements. But at the time that I falsely confessed to the crime, I had no choice. And I, and I was very, very upset and angry, angry at Woody for a very long time. But I had to ask myself. Well, wait, why are you mad at Willie? You know, you did the same thing here, you know. Um, where's your culpability in all this? And so I had to come to grips with that, you know, because I made a full, a full confession of everything that Willie in, in the crime. And, you know, that's, you know, who was I to be mad at him when I actually did the same thing to him? So that was my rationale uh, for forgiveness, you know. But um, now the day goes by when I don't think about this guy, you know, and... When I think about Willie, too, I think of, wow, this is a guy, well, he made a confession that lasted maybe 10 minutes, and it basically cost him his life. You know, he, 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 died in, you know, he died in prison, as Mark said, and he passed away on December 3rd, 2001, on the date of my younger brother's birthday. So, I mean, 
when I found out about his death, all I could think about was how and why could this happen? You know, this is a man, you know, a kid, basically, that didn't do anything to the prison in the first place. But yet, he had lost his life. I didn't find out until later on that he had a massive heart attack at 31 years old. So, I mean, so when I, you know, of course, I heard about his crime, um, I continued to fight on. And I promised myself, and of course, I promised him that I would get us both to where we need to be. And that's to get our names cleared from this horrific crime. Um, and to this day, um, I really have trouble um, talking to his mom. His mom assured me on the day that we were exonerated because the district attorney in Brooklyn allowed her to sit in for her son, she assured me that everything was okay. But I can't face it because there's something called trauma. And that trauma is real, at least with me. And what this trauma does, it, it, it doesn't allow me to look his mom in her face and talk about what I'm doing with my life because I know her son should be doing what he should be doing with his life. And I can't get past that. And I'm trying to get help for that. And it's hard because his mom is one of the nicest, sweetest persons in the world. And to know that Willie's not here and I am afraid in some ways to go see her and talk to her. It's one of the biggest shames that I had to deal with probably for a long time. But at the end of the day, I'm standing here and I'm going to live my life with Willie Stucky in mind and do the very best I can with it because I know that's what he and I know that's what his mom would want. But false confessions are real and they have deadly consequences, unfortunately. And I'm here to tell you that Willie Stucky is one of those individuals. Like a, a good childhood friend of mine, I knew Willie since I was six years old. I'm here, and he's not. And it's basically because of a confession that he and I made that was not true. And law enforcement, the prosecutors, knew the confessions were not true. So when people hear false confessions, or, or when they hear confessions in general, I should say, the first inclination is to say, well, they did not commit the crime. Why did they confess? Because law enforcement has many ways of securing a confession out of a person, whether it be physically, psychologically. It happens all the time. And when I say to groups, when I talk to them, it's that it can happen to any one of us. And believe me, it happens more than we think. So I'm here to ask you guys, please. And I am never one to indict the public for anything. The public is allowed to do whatever they feel like they're doing. That's their problem. But I can say here, and I can stand here today and say to you, please, pay attention to this issue. Because it's, it's very important. You know, because young men are being sent to prison, not really realizing that these lives are being destroyed. Not only the guys that sent to prison, but their families too. So, when I say that um, false confessions have deadly consequences, they really, really do. Because I lost my dad in 2005 when I was incarcerated. And all I could think about after his death was why did I allow these police to make me confess to a crime I didn't commit. So the worst thing I can do with my life is to second guess things. But that's part of life, I think. And I do that from time to time. But at the end of the day, I know what's important here. And what's important here is to make sure that I live my life accordingly. And that means doing whatever I can to help whoever I can. Because I'm standing here not because of me. I'm standing here because of a lot of other people, people that I've never met my entire life. And I'm always going to be indebted to those individuals for reaching out to me and helping me out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was very powerful and moving. We're going to now turn to our fourth speaker, Jeffrey Deskovic. I met Jeff actually 10 years ago. It's hard to believe it's already been 10 years. And it was at Marty's. Marty wasn't there because he was still incarcerated. But at the oral arguments that were part of the 19th and ultimately successful appeal that led to Marty's freedom. And Jeff had gotten out not that long beforehand and went as a show of support 
and it really is something that he has done tirelessly for the last 10 years. Now, I want to mention one thing about Jeff's case in particular, because what it highlights is how powerful the word confession is in a court of law. Because when Jeff was convicted in 1990, they had early DNA testing. And they tested the DNA, and it was a horrific rape murder case of a girl in his high school. And they tested the DNA, and it was not Jeff. And that went to trial, but the jurors believed the confession over the DNA. And it took 16 and a half years of him tirelessly working to have that DNA retested and have it be put into the now existing database that could provide a match to who the real perpetrator was. And they denied every request of his over and over and over. And finally, when he was able to get it tested, it turned out to be a match to someone else who had actually murdered another person during the time when Jeff was incarcerated for that first conviction. So it's extraordinary what it shows about the, the power of a confession uh, in the court of law. Jeff, I've really enjoyed getting to know him over the past 10 years. When I saw him, he'd just gotten out, and he was struggling. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, it was a hard adjustment um, for him. But since then, it's been an incredible pleasure and joy to see him grow and thrive. Um, he went on to get his BA from Mercy College, his MA from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He's become a national spokesperson on criminal justice reform, on wrongful convictions, on false confessions. He's given over 100 presentations around the country. He's authored over 200 articles that have come out in all sorts of different publications, including CNN, Al Jazeera, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And he's also been lobbying political officials, um, particularly in New York, but in New York, DC, uh, in, in Connecticut, also in Washington, D.C. on a national level. He's testified in hearings in many parts of the country. Um, he's an extraordinary leader for this movement, and I'm very happy that he could join us tonight. I'm happy to introduce him to you here. Jeff. Good evening. I need more energy than that. Good evening. Good evening. All right, it's great to be free. Um, so I'm going to start off, um, I'm going to dis um, discuss my own uh, false confession, which I think is instructive, and then I'll move on to what the red flags are that indicate that a confession may be false. I'll turn to the discussion about what reforms could be done in order to prevent wrongful convictions caused by coerced false confessions, and I'll close by giving some practical advice because I think that we should all have a, a takeaway, something that we can um, activate and, and utilize um, from this. So I went to the uh, uh, police station uh, on a uh, school day. Uh, and because it was a school day, neither my mother nor my grandmother with whom I lived, they didn't realize that anything was wrong, and so hence they did not call around looking for me. I was driven to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County, whereas I was a native of Peekskill in Westchester County. The significance of my sharing that with you is that that meant I was no longer able to leave on my own. I was instead dependent upon the police. They put me in a small room. I did not have an attorney present. I wasn't given anything to eat the entire time I was there. There were three officers there who I knew were officers, but then there was also the polygraphist, who was a Putnam County Sheriff's investigator who was dressed as a civilian and was pretending not to uh, be a cop. Before attaching the polygraph machine uh, to me, the polygrapher gave me countless cups of coffee. It seems fairly clear in hindsight that the purpose of giving me all this coffee was to uh, get me nervous. Following that, the polygrapher uh, strapped me into the uh, lie detector machine. They played the game known as good cop, bad cop, when, in which uh, an officer uh, pretends to be a friend who's somehow powerless to intervene, yet his partner is uh, is the bad cop who's really uh, uh, aggressive. And of course, the purpose of this tactic is that when a person is being questioned and becomes nervous, it's only natural that you would look to a friendly face for assistance. So after attaching this uh, polygraph machine to me, the polygrapher launched into his third degree tactics. He invaded my personal space. He raised his voice at me. He kept asking me the same questions over and over again. As each hour passed, so too did my fear increase in proportion to the time. He kept us up for between six and a half to seven hours. Towards the end of the interrogation, the polygrapher 
made a statement to me. He said, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told us through the test results that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm this. When he said that to me, that really shot my fear through the roof. At that point, the officer who was pretending to be my friend, he came in the room and told me that the other officers were going to harm me, but that he was holding them off, but could not do so indefinitely. You have to help yourself here, you understand. Considering that I had maintained my innocence for the previous six and a half to seven hours, it was fairly clear what he meant by that. They wanted me to confess. When it was added that if I did as they wanted, not only would they stop what they were doing, but that I could go home afterwards, being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, not thinking about the long-term implications, just being in fear of my life. I was painfully aware of the fact that nobody knew where I was. I didn't even know where I was. I was totally overwhelmed emotionally and psychologically. And at the same time, there's this push-pull dynamic in play in which on one hand the possibility of harm has been introduced and on the other uh, this officer has thrown me this false life preserver you know telling me that if I did as they wanted that I was not going to be arrested just trying to get out of the interrogation room never thinking anything beyond that I made up a story based upon information which they had given me in the course of their interrogation. By the police officer's own testimony, by the end of the interrogation, I was on the floor in a fetal position, crying uncontrollably. Needless to say, I was arrested. I was charged with a murder and rape. My interrogation was not videotaped. It was not audio taped. There was no signed confession. It was just the police officer's word as to what happened. Because of this lack of objective record, the cops were able to lie during their testimony and leave out the, cool, the two crucial uh, facts, which were the two illegal things that they had engaged in, which was the threat and the false promise. What are the red flags associated with uh, false confessions? Those would include the length of interrogation, uh, particularly when combined with food deprivation, the misuse and abuse uh, of, of the polygraph, uh, certainly the uh, age of the person being questioned. False confession experts have determined that youth are a particularly vulnerable population, although normal adults have given false confessions as well. People with mental health issues are also particularly susceptible to false confessions because the way that people with mental illnesses compensate for their mental illness is they try to be uh, compliant with authority figures. When that authority figure is law enforcement seeking to get a confession, that's a recipe for injustice. If the facts of a confession are, contra of, uh, are if, if the statements in a confession are in opposition to known external evidence, then that's a clear red flag. So in my case, for example, uh, I made a statement and I said that I hit the victim over the head with a Gatorade bottle. But a Gatorade bottle would be incapable of inflicting the type of injuries that the medical examiner said the victim suffered. There was no shattered glass at the scene, nor were there any shards of glass found in the victim's body. Of the level of uh, if the level of language that is used uh, exceeds the formal education and life experience of the suspect, then that's another, uh, that's, an, that's another red flag. If a confession is written by a law enforcement rather than by a suspect, then that's a red flag. If a police officer is asking yes, no questions as opposed to asking open-ended questions in which somebody who actually did commit the crime would have to fill details in. So if those just yes, no questions rather than open-ended, then that's also a red flag. If an interrogator incorporates an item, a piece of information about the crime into a question, and then not too long after that in the dialogue that follows, the verbal exchange that follows, the suspect then incorporates that item into the confession, 
then that's another red flag. If it's a co-defendant situation, if the co-defendants tell different stories, then that's yet another, uh, that's, that's another red flag. The police giving details uh, of a confession is a red flag. Law enforcement is supposed to withhold certain crucial key elements, both from the public as well as from the person being questioned. That information is supposed to be used as, as a safeguard so that when, an, when a confession is given, uh, it can be evaluated whether or not that not those non-public, the non-public information uh, is contained in the confession uh, or not. But when those details are given, either inadvertently or deliberately, then contaminations occurred. And so if that happens, that's another red flag. Case in point, anyone who wants to uh, focus in on uh, Brandon Dassey, which uh, Professor Howard showed earlier, at one point, the uh, officer, I guess he's just out of frustration, he volunteers to the suspect. She, after asking what happened to the victim's head and not getting the right answer because it's obviously a false confession, he volunteers. She was shot in the head, right? Well, that's an example of sharing a crucial non-public fact. That's a huge red flag. So having known about what these red flags are, is there no way to utilize that knowledge that we've arrived at only through the you know, painful uh, lessons of wrongful convictions caused by coerced false confessions? What are the reforms that we can uh, util uh, utilize to prevent wrongful convictions from occurring based on coerced false confessions? Well, the first thing is that instead of just simply having a pretrial hearing at which the sole issue is voluntariness of the statements, which is what we have now, we should, in a, we should additionally uh, have a hearing uh, before a confession could be used as evidence in which the, the judge is looking at the accuracy, the truthfulness of a confession using those red flags. Each one of those is not something made up. It's not something that I think. These are lessons which are extracted uh, from cases that ultimately terminated in a exoneration through DNA, but only after you know, significant time was spent. So if a judge was to evaluate these factors and, you know, uh, before a confession could be used, I think that we could reduce the number of wrongful convictions caused by coerced false confessions. Uh, having, allowing false confession expert testimony in the courtroom is key. The experts do not give an opinion on whether a particular confession is coerced uh, or, and, and false. That's something that's the province of the, of the jury or uh, the judge if it's a bench trial. Instead, the experts give crucial contextual information as to what the factors are that would lead an innocent person to confess. That's very important because that's not common knowledge, that's specialized knowledge that's arrived at after study, and so therefore, ordinary citizens can't be expected to know that but the jury is, con is made up of ordinary citizens, so the expert could provide that contextual information. The jury could decide, you know, based on those factors, whether that particular confession is, uh, is false uh, or not. Maybe, maybe it's not false, but they have to have that crucial information to make that assessment. Uh, lastly, it's, it's been uh, emphasized already, but it has to be repeated, the importance of videotaping uh, the entire interrogation, um, both from the beginning and, and the, uh, from the beginning to the end, not just simply the part at which the suspect confesses, but from the moment of cus the custodial questioning begins all the way to the end. No selectively starting and stopping the uh, videotape. What is what is there to hide? Uh, and with with the camera, with the camera fully focusing on both the uh, interviewer as well as the person. Uh, being being questioned. Uh, there are examples of people being wrongfully convicted despite the videotaping, and that's why those other reforms are important, that the videotaping might be the centerpiece, but without those other pieces of the package, it, the building is uh, not quite fully built. Uh, we close out, uh, just to give a little uh, practical information, a takeaway, uh, something to be able to know and utilize. I don't think that it's really known uh, by most of us uh, what to do if a police officer wants to question you. You know, false confession experts have determined that 
the innocence of a suspect often works against them because the thought process, someone who's innocent, is that if you're innocent of the crime and you don't know anything about it, you know, why would you need to assert your rights? What could possibly happen if you talk to the police? But I think as you've sat here and looked up on the stage, you can see that quite a bit could actually happen if you decide to go down that wrong road. Uh, what you should do if the police want to question you is you give your pedigree information, what your name is, where you live. And the third thing that you need to say is, I want a lawyer. There's nothing that law enforcement needs to speak to you about that's so crucial, so time sensitive that it can't wait for them to give you a lawyer and then proceed. The lawyer will level the playing field. The lawyer will prevent you from being coerced and overwhelmed. They won't dare to do the tactics they engaged in on any of the people uh, on the stage tonight. That's very important. Uh, you should share that information with people who, for whatever reason, weren't, uh, weren't able to uh, make it tonight. Uh, there's too many people, there's too many of us that you know, we waive our rights and we really don't understand what we're doing. We don't really understand what it means to knowingly, willingly, and intelligently waive our rights. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Jeff. You know, one thing that I want to say is that you've heard them all speak individually, but there's something else that's amazing about them, which is that they have a bond with each other. They have a, a brotherhood of sorts of the wrongfully convicted, of the exonerated. And it's something I got to see this morning. So actually, Marty, Jeff, and David drove down from New York together. They had sort of an exoneree road trip of sorts. <laughs> Yousef couldn't come with them because he had two prior speaking engagements today in New York and then <laughs> took a quick train down here to be with us. This is his third event of the day. But really, they share something through their common suffering, through the injustice, but it's also a strength and it's a caring about each other. Just when we were at lunch today, Jeff got a phone call from someone else who has been exonerated, and then they found out that someone else they know, I think it's in the Bronx, who's coming Richard, out tomorrow. Richard Rosario. Richard Rosario yes, coming yes. out tomorrow. There's a, there's a concern that they have for each other. And actually, David was saying that the day he got out, he spent four hours on the phone with Marty, who was helping him through the adjustment. That's so difficult. So it's incredible what they have, not just as amazing individuals, but together as a group. And there are actually many more who aren't here tonight but that they're part of the same group with. Thank you all for your patience. Now, I want to open the floor up to questions and to have a discussion. So, can, can, I, can I add one thing? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think you're on a mic. Um, one thing I want to add is something that's kind of been developed, and there's a gentleman in the room who I got to meet through my undergraduate professor, Robert Leonard, and it's forensic linguistics. It's something that some in this room may have never heard of before, but for false confessions, it's a very important subject. And one of the best examples I heard from Rob Leonard was he worked on a case where it was an African-American suspect and two white detectives. And he was brought in to evaluate a written confession. And what he was able to determine was that it was two white detectives who wrote out this confession <laughs> using African-American vernacular. And it was only because a forensic linguistic expert brought in was that they were able to establish that the suspect really was innocent. So you know, as we move forward, forensic linguistics is an amazing area of law and science. And if you've never heard of it before, look at it. It is truly amazing. I took several classes with Professor Robert Leonard Hofstra but you have some amazing professors at this school. Natalie meeting. Schilling, who's here in the audience, a professor of forensic linguistics um, at Georgetown. Take her class. Know, take her class. Um, and anybody who has actually studied the history of forensic linguistics, uh, you will find it has been used in some very high profile cases to solve a case. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marty. The floor is open. Questions and speak up so we can hear you. We do have a mic we could bring to people if it's hard to hear. Yeah.
I could say just very quickly, <laughs> the, 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 the day Yusuf and I testified, can you guys hear me? The day Yusuf and I testified, the current Attorney General Eric Schneiderman was a state senator. He, was, he has been the only public official that has ever apologized to me, and he did it publicly. Um, and, and, and the he very wasn't responsible for the conviction. He was not he responsible was for the state. conviction. He was a state senator who was actually holding hearings that day on wrongful convictions. And he publicly apologized on behalf of all of New York State residents and politicians and the criminal justice system for what happened to me. He is the only one that has ever apologized to me. My, my case is very similar. Um, the, the apologies that I've received have been from Thomas Sewell. You know, um, the, the actual people who set up the Cooney and Water Foster Road prison, they actually were able to retire the four people. Many of them um, uh, went on to do other things. Linda, uh, Linda Fairstein? Linda Fairstein. The prosecutor. Linda Fairstein. Just before she blocked me a while back, the, the, the screen capture that I was able to get, which really is telling of her story, uh, she wrote a book that said, it says, Linda Fairstein, Lethal Legacy. That was one of the books that I was able to see before she blocked me. Now, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lederer, she also went on to uh, build her career off of our back. And that's really what happens in most of these she started working as an adjunct professor at Columbia Law. And all of the students that she was, she was teaching, they started a petition. They didn't want her to teach them anything because they knew about the Princess Art Graduate School. When the film came out, they were outraged. And what did the, the uh, institution do? They protected her. So on her bio on the, on the, on the uh, Columbia Law website, her bio used to say that she had all of these accolades that she litigated the Princess Park Graduate School. And so now when you go to her bio, <laughs> it's completely whitewashed and gone. You don't see any of that. Other people went on and became hired muscle for the mob. You know, one guy uh, was, was caught in the sting. One of the officers in our case was caught in the sting. Uh, found a dead uh, drug dealer up in, the, in the Upper Harlem. And uh, him and his colleagues split the money they found in the truck. And the, the, the rookie cop They were able to all retire with their full pension. That's really what I'm, I'm trying to get at. The Central Park Graduate School, so I want to just quickly wrap up with this piece. The Central Park Graduate School is only one of the many cases that these officers, that these prosecutors, that these judges have went out, have litigated. What I submit is that if they were able to convince so many people that we were guilty, that they found out we actually didn't do it 13 years later, but if they were able to convince so many people that we were guilty. How many other cases? How many other cases? That's why I say they built their careers off of our back. Well, as for me, um, after we were, after Willie and I were exonerated, um, the assistant prosecutor in our case, who's now a Nassau County, a sitting judge in Nassau County, Eric Bjornaby, I'm a name drop here, um, he was livid that we actually were exonerated because he was determined, he was steadfast that mm -hmm. Willie Sucker and I were, were guilty. So he didn't um, offer an apology. In fact, he didn't come close to offering one. And so um, for us, we never got an apology from anybody. But similar to Yusuf, what I did in law, in fact, right after I was exonerated, I went, I was in, in fact walking in Lower Manhattan and um, a woman walked up to me and said, I'm so sorry. And I just looked at her and smiled and said, that's not necessary, but the public apologized for something that happened nearly 30 years ago. And it had nothing to do with it, but to me, it touched my heart to know that there were people in our society who has, <coughs> who has the good intentions. So it was really good to hear that from him, even though he didn't have to say it. It would be nice to get it from law enforcement, too. Very <laughs> nice to get it from them. Um, yeah. The detective in my case is deceased now, so yeah. won't be getting it from him. But his partner is um, still, still alive, but I doubt that would happen either. But yeah. um, apologies are very hard to come by by law enforcement for whatever reason. 
Jeff, I know you didn't get an apology. <coughs> no, I didn't get an apology. Um, the uh, I got a symbolic apology from the uh, from the judge and the prosecutor, but neither of them were the people that were originally involved in my case. Uh, the one apology I did get from anyone who had anything to do with it, uh, we ironically, right, was, was the uh, actual perpetrator apologized. Uh, he was more of a man in that instance than any of the, any of the other people. But to address the last part of your question in terms of um, uh, compensation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I did, you know, receive some compensation. It took a long time to do that. Uh, most people don't realize that it takes between three to seven years between the point of release and for compensation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the state just releases you with nothing. They don't provide you with housing, cost of living expenses, uh, mental health, uh, doctor and dental care, job training, job placement, public transportation. None of that is off. You're just released, uh, almost like uh, returning an animal back out to the wild. Let, let me just say, when, he, when Jeff talks about being released, imagine, I can tell you from my experience, when I went to the DMV, here I am out three weeks, and they say, do you have six forms of identification? <laughs> <laughs> I had a social security card, a photo ID from Hofstra University, my birth certificate, and a newspaper article with my picture on it. Wow. And thankfully, there was a supervisor there who said, okay, we know who you are, and they overrode the rules. But for each one of us, <laughs> when we got out, there were no services offered. There was no kind of schooling, okay? And you know, I don't know how many other exonerees were, would be fortunate enough to go to the DMV and have that kind of waiver. You know, but you, you mentioned compensation. What amount of compensation would you take <laughs> to be in prison for five, 10, 15, 20 years? Quite often we hear that, um, you know, they got $15 million. Ask the average person if they said, you have to be in prison for 20 years, not knowing if you would walk out, but you could get $20 million. Would you take it? No. Okay, but in each one of our cases, some of us have settled. Okay, but there's no single dollar amount that will ever change the fact, and I say this, that we were kidnapped by the state of New York imprisoned, enslaved in many ways, because we were working for the state, so there's really no dollar amount that can ever change our lives. What's gonna change our lives is us sitting up here today, moving forward in our lives, trying to change the system, trying to educate people of the problems in the system. You know, and, and when we do these panel discussions, quite often everybody says, well, it's only one type of people, and I think this panel can demonstrate that False confessions, wrongful convictions go across all diversity. Um, it's age groups, it's economic groups. Each one of us grew up in different economic areas and it really didn't matter. When the system wants to get you, they will get you. I just wanna add, you know, Marty mentioned, you know, as a hypothetical figure, $15 million, but I want everyone to understand, right, that that's just like a hypothetical figure he's saying. Nobody is getting that act, that kind of money, so they're not. No, seriously, it's, it, it's shameful. It's shameful the amount of money that some exonerees get. It, you know, just just to point just to point that out. You know, one one of the other things I want to say is that as well is in terms of all of the laws that need to happen to change the the system from being the criminal system of injustice to being the criminal justice system. In many of these cases there was a speedy method to convict us. But when they found out that we were innocent, there was no speedy method to compensate them. In fact, I'm sure in all of our cases, they were hoping that we did a misstep, that we somehow ended back up in prison, or that we somehow passed away during the process. I'm sure that's what they were hoping to happen. Let's take a few more questions that I'll group them. So they all have a lot to say, so if we do one at a time, it might take a long time. I saw you next, and then over here, and then over here. Uh, so I wanted to ask about your criminal counsel. How was their reaction to the case? Did you receive any kind of criminal counsel? Current law enforcement, okay. Over here, yeah. Well, 
Well, I'll tell you, I have my ninth grade daughter here tonight, and I've told her that for years, actually. And, but, and it's but actually what one of the things that Professor Richard Alshe teaches on the first day of his class to every one of his students is, yeah. you ever get stopped, I want a lawyer. If they ask for your consent to search, no, I want you a not lawyer. have my consent. <laughs> Can I just add one, one quick thing? Um, I went, last year I went to Orlando to the, what we call uh, an exoneration conference, mm -hmm. and Marty just mentioned, and di mentioned diversity, right? And so when I was incarcerated, I considered myself a student of wrongful convictions, meaning that I researched a lot of articles, read about a lot of cases, including these guys' cases, which, I mean, I feel like I'm, I can be their lawyer. That's how much I read about these guys' cases. But when I went to Orlando to this exoneration conference, I was really surprised at how many women that I saw there. I mean, there were so many women there who were exonerees that um, that night, that very first night that I was there, I went up to the hotel room and I thought about that for at least an hour and a half. I, said, I couldn't believe that because I had done so much research on this issue and you really came across women who were exonerated. So but to see them in person and to meet them in person, to me, was, um, I, was I was really taken aback by that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, let me take a few more questions. Yeah. Languishing there, awaiting trial. And then eventually, yeah. said, "You know what? I can't take it anymore. Let me just confess." Without being convicted. Without being convicted. Okay. So he took a plea bargain. He took that plea, but when he went before the judge, they said, I'm going to have to take it to you. So he took his plea bargain, he didn't take that. Withdrew plea. it. Now he's in custody. He's yeah. trying to get a new man to help him do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's something, let's talk about that after the particulars and how we could possibly help. Yeah. So, some other questions. Yeah. Take one more here, Cameron. No, sorry, they they were pro bono. All the uh, lawyers. J j just so you know, you're talking about the post-conviction lawyers. Yeah. Okay, it started with a. I'll be very quick yeah. about this. Yeah. The law firm of Miller, Cassie, LaRocca, and Lewin in. 1994, okay, 1994, 1995, when my state appellate lawyers couldn't work on the case because they'd expended almost a million dollars in pro bono hours. So it was Steve Braga, Barry Pollock, and Jennifer O'Connor who were the small firm. That little group of three lawyers branched out over the years, and they all worked pro bono, okay? And it ended up becoming a huge amount, thousands of hours. I mean, if you think about the billable hours that really could be calculated, it's an atrocity that it took that many lawyers. My trial was I had one or two lawyers, okay, that we paid for, and he was a good lawyer, okay? And quite often, even great lawyers are up against the biggest law firm in each county 
which is the prosecutor's office. Defense lawyers don't have subpoena power. They can't get wiretaps. There's a lot of things they can do that law enforcement can. One of the remedies that's actually kind of being implemented, I think, around the country is you have more and more innocence projects. With the innocence projects, you're getting a lot of the big law firms and some of the small law firms who are creating this kind of intimate relationship with the innocence projects because there's not enough lawyers who are doing this work. And most people don't realize, and Sheila can tell you, the level of work it takes and the hours it takes. I mean, this is, you're talking about, I mean, think about it. My case has been going on for 10 years. So imagine having to review a case that has been going on just for 10 years to get the basic understanding of a case. Now all of a sudden you, you, do, you hire investigators and they go out and they've tracked down 15 new witnesses. And then you gotta interview those witnesses and maybe you have to polygraph some of those witnesses. And then if there's forensic evidence, you gotta do the forensic testing. So the, the, the level of work that it takes to get these cases to a point of exoneration is huge. So we had a bunch of questions. I think since we're pretty much over time, out of time, I'm just gonna let each panelist respond. Do you maybe wanna go in reverse order? Do you wanna start, Jeff? Um, which question do I wanna ask? You, oh. get to pick, <laughs> you get to pick from them. Maybe take just a minute or two to answer the, the points that were most uh, direct to you. Yeah, I mean, just, just that as has been said, you know, it, it's very expensive to be able to uh, exonerate wrongfully convicted people. I mean, I have a nonprofit organization that we, we work to free people, and uh, there's many other similar organizations. But you know, we need we need people to donate to those. You know, I think that a big a big misconception is that you know donations are something that wealthy people or middle class people you know do only. You know, if you look at these political campaigns, you know, uh, a lot of money is being raised, even if it's only you know three five dollar increments, ten dollar but on a residual basis, and it adds up to a lot. If everyone does a little bit, we, we can do a lot. You know, I have a Patreon campaign on, on um, the internet, which you know, people can uh, contribute to. But consider doing that because you know it takes a salary to have, have a lawyer, have investigators, the legal costs, the paralegals, uh, and, and everything. Uh, so that, that's really the thing that I want to, uh, it's not somebody else's problem. It's all of our problems. Yeah, well, uh, just to her, to her point, I think um, she, there's, 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 there's definitely other mechanisms that one can use to help uh, people who are incarcerated lawfully. Um, one, of those, uh, one of those mechanisms is just simply to um, just volunteer your time. You know? And I think that would go a long way because there are many rallies in New York City, for example, and so I'm not sure here in D.C. how many rallies. This is probably Rally Central, but I'm assuming. But so there, there's many ways that one can contribute to a particular cause of that wrongful conviction. It doesn't, uh, legal representation is only just one arm of it, but there's several other aspects that can take place, like rallying and, and things, forming support groups, and just be an activist, I guess, in that area. I think that can go a long way in you know, helping out people who desperately need the help in more ways than one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was trying to remember the exact question about the law enforcement bit in terms of current law enforcement. Um, maybe that was the question. Okay, so I got some great examples. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm gonna wrap it into the second piece, which I would say has to involve uh, going back to what they used to do back in the days in terms of teaching civics and things like that, right? Which is something that they don't really do today. Um, two stories. One day I was riding my bike home from Central Park as I should, but I decided to go get some exercise. And as I'm riding my bike home, it started to get dark, and I got all the way back uptown to about 116th Street and Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem. And I said, you know what, it's too dark. Let me ride my bike on the sidewalk, and, and that way I'll avoid getting hit by a car. So I get on the sidewalk, and I get about one block and two officers snatch me off my bike. My level of frustration went through the roof. And then they began to 
form, they, they have this mechanism, you know, police departments have thought to deal with what they think hostile people are in a particular way. So they, tar- they started to form around it. And I said to them, I know exactly what you're doing. And then I started having a little dialogue with them. I put my bike in between myself and them. And I told them who I was. And I broke down the fact that many, if not all, citizens want to be law-abiding citizens. But how do we follow a law if we don't know that it exists? If you would have said to me, excuse me, sir, you can't ride your bike on the sidewalk if it's against the law, you need to be under the age of 12, I would have said, no problem, I didn't know that. And I would have taken my bike either back in the street or I would have walked home on the sidewalk with my bike in my hand. After this brief interaction, the officers actually had the nerve to say to me, can you come to the precinct to be a liaison between us and the community? Second story. (laughs) I I find this work much more pleasing and, and, and better, right? But I left my house and I was in a rush. And this is before the film, before or before the film, before exoneration. No, I think I was exonerated already. But it was before the film. And I got into an, a minor accident. A, a, a New York City uh, taxi hit me while I was trying to get a fare. And the person that was trying to get into the taxi, even though the taxi driver said, come on, come on, come on, come on, after he hits me. They were like, I'm not getting in the car with you. (laughs) You know, the taxi then pulls off and begins to uh, go further. This is all near Columbia University. I sped off in front of the taxi, cut the taxi driver off, and got out of my car. Called the cops. The security officers that were working at Columbia University saw everything. The taxi driver gets out of his car, walks over to my car. He says, there's nothing, you know, this, this is your fault. This is your fault. And then he says, oh my back and goes back to his car and lays in his car like as if you know that whole thing like that the police officers come and they say license and registration of all of us and I said I said sure didn't have my license or registration on me and I said uh, I, I don't have it on me I ran out of the house mistakenly um, but I can prove who I am and they looked at me funny like, who is this guy? You know? <laughs> and I said, you remember the Central Park Jogger case? And that happened to be a black officer and a white officer. There. So the black officer, no, the white officer, this is the funny part, the white officer backs up. <laughs> and he, he, he taps the black officer like, back up, man, back up. <laughs> <laughs> and then the white officer says, you're not going to call uh, Al Sharpton on us, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tells me he's going to give me a ticket anyway. But he says, listen, you've been through enough. When we get to the, fight the ticket, when we get to the DMV, I'm going to make sure the ticket gets thrown out. Through the form, he gets to the DMV. He says, I don't remember what happened that night. The judge says, this is what happened. Takes the ticket. Throws the ticket out. He leaves. We meet each other in the hallway. And I said, wow, that was the best officer experience that I've ever had in my <laughs> life. You know? And he said, look, man, you guys have been through enough. I'm just trying to do my part in making sure that your life is clean for my life. And so, like I said, there are some good cop situations, but the reality is that common law practices are things that a lot of people don't know. Even when we're riding down the block, I mean, I know D.C. is very unique, that you could be riding down a block yesterday, and all of a sudden today, that whole block that you were riding down, they done changed the way the hours go, so you can't <laughs> ride down that block anymore. You know, and I mean, that's important, though, because when they do things like that, or if they tell people that this is the new law, this is the laws of the land, but nobody knows what those laws are. Like in New York City, it's against the law to jaywalk. If you're a New Yorker, <laughs> you jaywalk. This, that's a New York thing to do. When I was in California, I told that same story. They said, don't do it out here. They'll give you some tickets. You know, that's just what I wanted to share. I'll give you two kind of quick law enforcement stories. Uh, generally speaking, everyone except the law enforcement people in direct involved in my case, I've gotten support from. 
I have been invited to speak at the NYPD. I've lectured at the NYPD Training Academy. And for the last two years, I actually regularly speak in the retired Suffolk County Police Commissioner's classes. So their kind of feeling towards me was, Marty got screwed, let's move forward. Um, you mentioned somebody about changing the law. Um, there's a lot that needs to be changed. My law school education reinforced a lot of my beliefs, and I'm hoping that once admitted to the bar, I can make some significant changes. Uh, one of the things that has been suggested to me repeatedly, maybe you should run for the Suffolk County District Attorney's <laughs> Office. Uh, and if anybody Googles Tom Spoda's name right now, it's probably the best time since he's subject to a federal investigation wow. right now uh, because the, Suffolk, the former Suffolk County Police Chief was just jail. pled guilty. <laughs> um, the Chief of Staff is under investigation. But there's one thing that we kind of men didn't mention here, which I think is very important and happened in David's case. When you're innocent and in prison, every time you appear before the parole board, the parole board expects you to admit your guilt. David was tragically forced to face that consequence. How many times? Four. Four. At one of the later times, I was actually a paralegal, I had been out a few years, said, this is unfair to David. And I actually took the step, I wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Law Journal because I was actually sticking up for David who I didn't know. But I said to myself, this is not a one-time case. There was an individual who was another exoneree from California who had the exact same problem. He was in jail. He actually admitted his guilt at his parole hearing because he was led to believe if you admit guilt at the parole hearing, you'll be let out. Finally, during his exoneration process, what do you think they brought up? Wow. His admissions at the parole hearing. And he kind of had to articulate, listen, I had to admit my guilt, otherwise I'd still be in prison. So, you know, there's multi-layered problems that each one of us have faced, we're involved in. You know, when you talk about changing legislation, we could go on and on and on. But the key thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, Youssef and I testified in 2008 about legislation that should have been in place that year. You know, uh, earlier this, earlier last year, I testified up in Albany, again before assembly members saying, how many more years are we going to have to wait in New York before this legislation, eyewitness reforms, reporting of electronic 